Hi, Gordon. Thanks for joining me again, friend. Hi, Tasha. It's good to see you again. Yeah. Um, I really enjoyed our last conversation. And you mentioned at the end of our last conversation that you were writing about your subconscious project in your newsletter. And I went ahead and read the whole backlog of your newsletter for uh, for this conversation and just absolutely loved what I read there. I think it's um, a terrific newsletter. And um, just for those who haven't read it yet, like each update is is quite short, but goes pretty deep into like a specific topic of interest that's related to your project or web trends in general. And there are just so many interesting observations there that were sort of synthesizing a lot of different um, matters of complexity into like pretty simple digestible pieces. So I just really love them and wanted to have you back on to kind of dive in deeper into these topics. Um, maybe you could start by talking about uh, what you're aiming for with that newsletter. Like what are you trying to create and wh what are you aiming for with each piece? Yeah, um, so I, I feel myself wading into a really complex design space with subconscious. Uh, we could talk a little bit about the project in a minute, but um, it occurred to me as I was sort of thinking through the design space that I felt like I was doing this connecting the dots exercise where I was first kind of identifying where the dots were and then sort of drawing lines between them in ways that made sense to me. But um, I actually feel that within the design space I'm exploring, there are many right answers. So what I wanted to do was kind of leave trail markers for others that might be helpful. Um, so really it's kind of a lab notebook uh, of sorts, like all of it is in process. And um, you know, it, it could be that some of the things that I write about, I might <laughs> later <laughs> disagree with. Like, I think I, I had a recent one where, um, I'm developing like a, a small markup language for this tool. And I ended up having some second thoughts about some of the choices that were made earlier, refactored it. So it's, it's very much living and in process, but um, yeah, I guess uh, it's, it's like a trail of breadcrumbs kind of mode of thinking, like a thinking out loud journal, if that makes sense. Yeah, I'd be curious to ask just almost because I do a lot of writing on the web myself, just like remove from the specific topics, if there's anything that you're aiming for with sort of like the writing style of it or the presentation or anything that you have in mind from kind of like a craft of writing perspective. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I'm surprised to hear you say that you, you think it's well written. I find writing very difficult. I don't think I'm very good at it, or at least it's it's very agonizing for me. <laughs> like it's like squeezing blood out of a stone or something. Um, so a lot of what goes on in there is, is me taking my rough notes and trying to shape them up and linearize them into, into a narrative. Um, I guess I don't have any goals except being clear. I remember writing or reading this uh, note from Kurt Vonnegut years ago where he basically says like the, the way to write well is to write clearly and, and don't try to have style. Um, or rather his point is that style is like a thing that you can reach for after you've kind of achieved that. So if, if, I, if I have a voice, I guess it's by accident. Um, part of the reason I'm actually pulling on this thread with subconscious at all, which, which is a kind of weird note-taking app, um, is, is because I'm so bad at writing, I, I feel like linear narrative is hard for me. Um, I have a hard way, uh, time thinking that way, but uh, that is most of the way we communicate as a species, um, either through language or through writing. And, um, and so it's, it's like, I wanna create some tools to, to help me with that, I guess. Uh, so hopefully these updates will get a little easier as, as my tool shapes up. <laughs> Yeah, I think, um, I don't know if you saw this, but well, this is two layers deep, but I have it in general, um, like a policy on my Twitter it, to only say like kind things, but I also have a tweet about um, like, why do mean subtweets when you can do nice or kind or, you know, fun subtweets. And I have, I have a subtweet of your newsletter that's been doing quite well. That's like, there's a whole genre of writing that takes complex matters and you know makes them simple and you feel brilliant when you read them so that's a subtweet <laughs> of your newsletter and people are quite liking this so um yeah that's I think funny. the fact that you've been chewing on these topics for so long it's just making a lot of like really interesting and novel connections and almost like each I'm getting this metaphor of like each newsletter entry being like 
like a stepping stone that you can kind of like land on. And then there's other stepping stones and uh, like they're each kind of like a different place. Um, like you published one just today about uh, like people sailing on the ocean and how they use the internet, these two people that are creating things and uh, the weird constraints that they're under. And like, it's like adjacent to all of the other things, but like it's a different place. And I just, I really enjoyed reading it. So um, I'm happy you're putting your updates out there. Yeah, you know, it's like, I have this problem in real life communicating where I have this deep sort of backlog of context that I'm working through and chewing on in my head. I'm in my head a lot. Um, and, and I end up getting into this sort of negative, like bad pattern of communication where I back up 10 steps and I'm, I'm telling somebody about something that's like so far removed from the actual point that I want to get to because I'm trying to build up like a pattern language, like a set of ideas that have been in my head. Um, and the fun thing about like uh, writing this newsletter has been to, to be able to sort of cultivate a little bit of a pattern language and kind of terraform maybe uh, space for people who are thinking in similar directions and have like a shared language around, uh, uh, I, I guess, what is the ensemble of things? It's like decentralization, the internet, um, building resilient technologies, building technologies that are more like human scale and humane. Um, so there's this kind of, set of ideas in this space. And uh, I guess I'm looking for for new angles within it, because I think a lot of good work has been done. Um, a lot of what I'm doing, I guess, is trying to look at old, boring things in a fresh light that might open up new possibilities. Yeah, it seems like um, as you, I got the sense too, that as you do this work of like, looking at these patterns and trends and old things that like you're kind of reconceiving of the software project that you're creating as you create it. And um, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. I'd, I'd be curious to ask and maybe as an update for those that might be listening to this conversation for the first time as well, just like how you're currently conceiving what subconscious is. Yeah. So, um, I guess I tend to resort to trying to describe <laughs> this, cloud of related directions uh, in three different ways. So one is, I guess, I'm building a sort of Web3 Notes app. Uh, the second is like, I'm building something that's kind of like a weird hybrid of Twitter and a wiki. And, and the third is, uh, I'm building something that's like a web browser reimagined for reading and writing and taking notes. Um, and the thing that I'm trying to point toward is somewhere in the triangulated space between all of those three things. Uh, so I, I feel like it's going pretty well. Um, there, I, so I spent most of my career working on browser engines and on the web. I, uh, I guess, let's see, most recently I was uh, designing Chrome VR while I was at Google. Before that, I worked at Mozilla on an experimental rendering engine called Servo uh, with the team there and a, a mobile operating system called Firefox OS some years ago. So kind of making the web do weird things. Um, and I, I care a lot about the web because it's the system that um, for all its faults is sort of collectively owned. It's something that we, um, we build together instead of being owned by one person or one company. And I, I think that has a lot going for it um, and is worth preserving. So I'm kind of curious, you know, how do you build systems like this? There aren't so many, there are a few, right? Like, I think email is another, podcast is another. And um, subconscious is kind of something in that space. It's, uh, it's a note-taking app, but I'm trying to build it on top of uh, open and distributed protocols. Um, so you could think of it as something a little more like a web browser where it's not so much a product that's like owned by one company, but like a series of open protocols where I'm, I'm going to offer a product built on top of it, but others would be free to use those protocols in their own ways, maybe build their own clients. Um, so I've, I've started the project by focusing on the, on the client, on the sort of the thing that you and I would use day to day, the note taking app. And um, I wanted to get the game loop right there because I feel like, and unless you have a good use case, um, nobody's gonna use any sort of distributed protocols, right? <laughs> so, uh, so I've been kind of, what, almost six months now working on that, um, it's shaping up pretty well. I, I got some basic note-taking flows working, um, stuff like link suggestions for, you know, relatedness based on what is in the content of your, of your notes. Um, I got the markup language, um, 
I have, uh, let's see, what else? Uh, you know, basic stuff, type ahead search, rich text editing, all the kind of like stuff that you need as a platform to build on top of. And now I'm starting to get to the fun stuff, which um, are a lot of product ideas I have around helping you generate new ideas, given the set of things that you've taken notes on already. So that's kind of phase one of the project is like building a client. But right now, everything's just saving to files on, on your phone or on your computer. And eventually, what I want to be doing is um, swapping that sort of basic file interface out for a distributed protocol that lets you um, take notes in a multiplayer context. So that's kind of where I get to this like weird hybrid of Twitter and a wiki. Like, I want to be able to take notes as a team. I want to be able to follow your thoughts, Tashin, and, um, and see what you've been thinking about and many other friends and incorporate that into uh, my ideas and, and my thinking. Um, so that's kind of what I'm angling toward. And um, yeah, it's it's been a journey, but it's been a lot of fun. Uh, yeah, I, I think part of the reason I'm increasingly excited about this is like seeing a direction for my own writing that's emerging, that's being possible, that's really made possible in particular by Twitter of like, over mm -hmm. time, there's like, you like you talk about this of like Lego blocks of like, thoughts and notes as Lego blocks, and then can you recompose them in interesting ways? And I don't know, I have a lot of nice, fun Lego blocks that I've built up over the years, and like other people have cool Lego blocks, and it really feels like um, you could build things by putting them together, or um, yeah, I've noticed recently that there's certain um, like beats or melodies that I riff on a lot, and that like there's probably novel, interesting combinations of those same melodies in new ways that like would be interesting for me to articulate. And so I would love um, a client that's like trying to help me do that as opposed to, you know, me just working on it on my own. So it's it's a really interesting idea. Um, where where would you say? Yeah. Uh, you know, I, just, I want to riff on that a little bit. So I had this design breakthrough a couple of years ago. I've been chewing on these things for, for some time. Um, and, and it was from this book called Design Cybernetics. I guess this might've been a year ago that I read this, but um, there's, a, there's a theory, like a cybernetics theory called conversation theory that kind of explores how people actually develop ideas, develop knowledge. Um, and actually it's kind of more general. It's like, how do systems learn? Even non-human systems like ecosystems, like a forest. And uh, it's based around this idea that there's a sort of circular feedback loop. So when you and I are talking, we're exchanging messages back and forth and sort of building up context together through our messages. And when you misunderstand or I misunderstand, we might repeat or reframe or offer an analogy. And the cycle continues until we're both confident that we share like a close enough understanding. Um, in, in like a programming sense, it's sort of like a distributed sync problem. Like we each have our own view of the universe and somehow we have to cooperate, right? So we exchange messages until we're like, oh, we're kind of synced. Maybe there's some conflicts, but we think this will work, right? Um, but what's cool is, is this, uh, this author, uh, Glanville, uh, he, who, who, who is developing this theory, he frames creativity as this sort of conversational feedback loop. But instead of a feedback loop that is designed to reproduce the same state in both minds, it's a feedback loop that's designed to produce a, 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 a state that neither participant knew existed. It's, it's sort of like, um, instead of converging toward a known endpoint, you're trying to diverge together into unknown territory. And, and that, that clicked for me because the cool thing about this um, this theory is it applies not just to people. You can sort of think about conversations uh, as, as a general thing. Like I have conversations when I take notes or sketch on a piece of paper. It's like I'm having a conversation between myself and myself as mediated through the paper. Or you can think of note taking as like conversations across time where I'm sort of able to look back at a conversation my, my prior self is having as mediated through those notes. And then that got me thinking like, what are the kinds of conversations that I could help um, catalyze in, in a tool that sort of are designed to create divergence, to program creativity? That, that's the core kind of, I guess, design insight that I'm trying to get to and that I've been building a platform around. 
Um, and I, I totally share your experience. Twitter for me acts that way today. And it's not perfect, but it's like being around this foment of all these interesting people, it's so provocative and so generative. Yeah, totally. Um, what what features or in particular, maybe like protocols, you know, because you're talking about having like two layers of the client that you're building, but also the protocols that you're building, like what are those on those levels? What are the things that you see yourself needing to build to or wanting to build to like make this kind of a tool possible? Yeah, this is an open question for me that I'm still exploring. So um, for the browser, the separation is sort of you have the, the thing called the browser and then behind it is a set of protocols called HTTP. Uh, and then actually underneath those, there's like TCP IP and some other lower level things. But um, so the question for me after I get to a client that is, you know, sort of alpha quality that I can put in people's hands is what is the sort of equivalent to, to HTTP? I think, um, let me give you some bookends, like some loose threads that I'm tugging on right now. I think there's, um, there's a space of new peer-to-peer -peer protocols that are really interesting, like DAT and IPFS. Um, uh, I think that might be called Hypercore now, but these are kind of meant to be replacements for HTTP. And the notion is that instead of pulling things from a server computer somewhere, um, there are ways in which, you know, by magic, these protocols find uh, that file on anyone's computer that has it and sends it to you. So it's like, let's distribute the workload across everyone. So that, that's pretty interesting. It comes with some, uh, technical challenges, partly because it's really new and partly because pure peer-to-peer -peer architectures come with some really interesting uh, design challenges and, and engineering challenges. And, and all of that is sort of rooted in the fact that, um, uh, <laughs> I guess peer-to-peer -peer tech is like a crash course in philosophies of, of relativism. <laughs> like there's no source of truth to appeal to. So you have to figure out how to cooperate in some other way. Um, I think there are other interesting protocols as well that I've been looking at that are federated. Um, so a good example of a federated system that works today is, is email. So email, uh, there are servers out there. There are like, you know, these big beefy computers that live in a warehouse somewhere uh, that take care of delivering you, your email and receiving email and forwarding it to you. And you might access that via something like a web interface like Gmail, or you might have a client like mail.app that you know, pulls that stuff down from the server to your local machine. And uh, federated systems are kind of interesting. They're like this hybrid mode where uh, you, you're leveraging the cloud, but um, in a way that kind of attempts to make it more fungible. So if I want to change email addresses, that's pretty easy to do. And it's also pretty easy to take my data with me. Um, additionally, I you know, I, I might have like a Gmail account, you might have uh, something else, fast mail or something, and we can freely talk to each other. And that, that's not really possible in centralized systems. You think about like Twitter and Facebook, you can't on Facebook message someone who's on Twitter or on Pinterest or something. It just, there's like a hard boundary, right? You just so the taking federal... screenshots of things on yeah, the right. <laughs> I know, it's funny. It's like we've resorted to the last remaining protocols, which are basically copy paste and, and screenshots. And, and like my fear is like soon those will be taken away too. <laughs> but um, yeah, the federated models, I think, can be really compelling. Uh, there's another one called uh, New Social that um, this, uh, this tool called Mastodon uses. Mastodon is kind of like a decentralized Twitter. Um, and, and so there are these federated protocols out there. They, they do have, uh, they're a little bit maybe easier to work through some of the um, engineering issues because you, you could say, well, there's no global source of truth, but I have a trustworthy relationship with the Gmail server, or I have a trustworthy relationship with my Mastodon server. And I trust them to tell me, you know, the right thing that like, this is a valid message, that it's from who, who it says it's from and, and that sort of thing. Um, it's really hard to establish federated protocols, though. Uh, the, the, <laughs> the thing is, is that in today's uh, internet economy, um, websites don't really want to federate, right? It's, it's actually pretty profitable to try to build up a network effect and then have like a hard 
sort of boundaries and walls around your product. Um, and, uh, and so I, sometimes I wonder like, could you launch something like email today? I, I'm not sure that you could. I think we kind of got lucky that it, it happened in the seventies, I think, before any of these more, um, uh, financial incentives were in play. Uh, so actually one way I've thought about this problem is maybe I, <laughs> I sort of exact, uh, like take email and uh, hack it to do what I want to sort of become a backend for a distributed kind of notes service. That would be kind of interesting because it would mean that all of your notes would live on, uh, like have a copy on your email uh, account. Um, comes That comes with its own disadvantages too. It's like very complex, old, old technology that is tricky to work with. So anyway, I'm sort of navigating this, this um, idea space. I sort I kind of suspect that I might end up with an architecture that is some hybrid of federated and truly peer-to-peer. -peer. Um, I, I don't know for sure. Like, I don't want to make a commitment because I'm still in the sort of like exploratory validating phase, but it strikes me that the hardest problems with true decentralized distributed peer-to-peer uh, usually are around um, workflows where you where you need uh, accounts, I guess, is, is probably the easy way to sum it up, like things where there's sort of access controls. Um, and uh, it's much easier to do like the full distributed thing if what you're publishing is just public and immutable, like is not going to change. Um, so the way I've been thinking about this is maybe there's like a federated protocol for for drafts and for private notes and but when you publish something publicly perhaps it gets uh, published to something like IPFS um, and uh, and that has a lot of nice properties like IPFS is fully distributed it's very durable everyone who pulls down uh, a copy of you know that material might retain it um, so yeah, I don't know. As a as a designer, I tend to try to look at ways to split the difference or sort of balance trade offs, and and that's what I'm thinking through right now for the architecture. Very interesting. Was that still in the weeds? <laughs> no, no. I I wanted to kind of get a sense of just how it's going with that. I mean, that's sort of um, not exactly impolite, but like pressing to be like, well, how's it going? This thing you're creating, but <laughs> I am curious because I want to use the thing. So uh, I'm curious about that. Yeah. Um, My hope is to have a sort of workable alpha um, maybe within a couple months, mm. um, but I'll, I'll have to ask people who use that alpha to have sort of patience to bear with because what it'll be doing actually is probably saving files um, locally. So there's not going to be any sync or anything like that until I work out some of these other sort of issues about the back end. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That makes sense. But at least you'll have the files, right? So you can do whatever you want with them from there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, maybe actually, you, one of the questions I want to ask is about these files. Like, it seems like you've invented your own uh, like markup specification for uh, this project and you're like creating that. And so I'd be curious if you could talk sort of a two-part question of like one what the problems are that you see with something like markdown which is quite mm. ubiquitous at this point but you know i've seen problems with it but I, i'd be curious how you would describe it and then what it is that you're trying to do with the specification that you're creating yeah uh i actually think markdown is pretty good for what it was designed to do um which is kind of a lightweight syntax for generating html um and to your point, I've been playing with a markup language that is, it sort of bears a passing resemblance to Markdown, but there's some, there's some minor differences um, and, and a couple major differences. Uh, so I guess um, interesting things about Markdown. So one is that uh, Markdown is kind of like a, uh, almost like a slang kind of um, dialect. Like there are many different variations on Markdown. And I think this is actually one of the reasons it's been so successful. Uh, so different websites will sort of add or remove features from it in different ways. Uh, and within the context of a particular website, that's very useful. Like I actually, I have a website myself um, where I kind of kludged wiki links, like double bracket links on top of Markdown and it works pretty well, you know? Um, this does, I think when, when you're tackling 
the kind of problem I am where uh, I'm trying to build a system that's that's a little bit like the web where there's like a standardized markup language like HTML. Um, it presents a bit of a problem, which is like, which flavor do you want? Um, you actually have to choose. And there have been a couple attempts to kind of standardize Markdown, I think maybe not totally successful. Like there's not, you know, sort of consolidated opinion about which one wins. Um, and, and I think that's also by design. I think John Gruber has sort of the inventor of Markdown expressed that it, this, it ought to be something that sort of proliferates in different directions, if I recall correctly. Um, there are some tricky bits about Markdown's syntax. Uh, this gets into some programmery stuff, but like Markdown basically looks kind of like what you would write anyway. Um, but there are a few funny things about the syntax where uh, it's actually not quite when you're parsing it with a computer, um, there are ambiguities. And so different Im implementations have to choose different uh, decisions, uh, uh, what to do with those ambiguities. Uh, this is sort of another tricky thing. Um, and I guess the biggest one for me, and this is a little bit uh, of a, a, a more of a choice about tastes, but Markdown has, has certain kinds of markups, uh, like the reference links. Um, I don't know if you're, you've seen this, but basically you can bracket some text and then have a little bracket with like an, an ID or something, like a little unique phrase. And then anywhere else in the document, you can have repeat that unique phrase and then have a URL. So the idea is, is it's sort of like a footnote, I guess, when you're writing. Um, the reason this is a little bit tricky is if you're trying to develop a rich text editor that's sort of live as you type, um, you need to be able to reparse the entire document to actually know what the user's intent is. And that can be a little bit expensive. Um, so this is where I kind of am uh, maybe applying a set of fresh eyes to the thing. It's, it's like, I won't say what I'm doing is the right way or the only way. It's more like choosing a different set of trade-offs. So um, subconscious, I'm experimenting with this markup language called subtext. And it looks a little bit like Markdown. It's like you do a little pound sign for headings, just like Markdown, a little dash for lists. Um, use a little angle bracket to quote things just like an email or in Markdown. Um, but there are a couple of subtle distinctions about the way it parses. So um, one is that it's line oriented. So that basically means that the only thing you need to know to make sense of the markup is the context of the single line that your, your caret is in, your, that you're currently editing text in. Um, and uh, that makes it really easy to parse. Uh, it also means you can parse it in a streaming fashion. So you could sort of have it coming in live and be rendering it as, as it comes in. Um, I've also made a couple choices with the markup that just make it really easy to implement. So I, I actually, I kind of like the ethos of Markdown that it should spread and proliferate. So I wanted to create something that would be very easy for other people to implement in in their systems. So a lot of the design is optimized for extreme simplicity in implementation. Um, and, and the line orientedness is a big part of that. Uh, there's a couple other features like the way uh, we do links is um, a little bit different from Markdown. Uh, basically, you, you can just paste in a URL if you have a URL and that'll work. Um, but there's also like a shorthand syntax for linking to other notes. And it's basically, it kind of works like a hashtag. It's like you write a slash and then you just write the, the path of the note. Um, and in subconscious, there'll be a bunch of like fun, uh, you know, sort of live as you type auto completion tools to help you with that process. Uh, but th this is like a very constrained syntax, right? It's like some people might feel that seeing URLs and paths in their text is ugly. Um, Unlike in HTML, where the link is like a, you know, it's it's like a text phrase, um, but I think for the purposes that I'm angling for, it kind of makes sense. Like when I when I've talked to friends and looked at their notes, there's a lot of just like URLs pasted in there, are just like kind of quick, uh, qu quick and dirty kind of writing, right? It's a different thing from publishing uh, something. You're optimizing for for ease of cap capture. 
Um, the other bit is uh, subconscious is going to make heavy use of transcludes. So um, rather than having a link with you know text, uh, the idea is that underneath the block where you've linked things, you're, we're actually going to show like a little summary, like a little kind of window into that note. Um, there are other tools that do this kind of thing like Rome. And uh, I, I think, you know, it's a great idea with a lot of history behind it, all going all the way back to Ted Nelson. Uh, I kind of feel that for the purpose of note taking, it's a better design than text links. Um, I would rather read a little summary of the thing that I'm linking to. So that's kind of what we're going for. And it's very much, a, um, <laughs> I, I, I like this ethos of sort of accepting the trade-offs that come with simplicity. And, um, and that's kind of what I'm going for, I guess, with this markup. And we'll see, you know, it's all experimental. Uh, I've, I've been experimenting with kind of transitioning my own corpus of notes over to this style and my website as well just as like a kicking the tires. And we'll get, I think we'll get a good sense of whether it makes it, whether it works for people when I can put it in, in other people's hands. Um, I, do, I do feel hopeful, like from a standpoint of just having a hunch, um, I look at Instagram or Twitter or, you know, uh, Slack, Discord, and they all have this kind of a syntax of like being able to at mention people or hashtag um, and I think we'll probably bring some of those into the markup as well. So being able to hashtag uh, within the context of a note to be able to to link to like a, a list view, for example, of things that match that term. Um, so it's, it's a little rough and ready, I guess, and, and designed for note taking rather than publishing. Did I see that you're also thinking about including something that has to do with like key value pairs? Can you talk about that? Yes. So um, this is something that I came around to after a, a, a bit of reflection going through um, internet standards. So if you kind of dig back through the history, there's this website called the IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force, and they document all of the historical design decisions that were made about the internet. It's very dry reading, but I'm like, well, you know, if you're going to make a web-like thing, you should probably understand what made the web work So and the internet. Um, but one of the things I noted was that uh, all of these systems, the internet and also the web, they have this concept uh, called headers. And headers are basically um, at the top of a document, you can have a series of key value pairs. Um, this, uh, it says it's kind of metadata, I guess, is one way to think about it. Like you could uh, say something like title colon and then put a title date colon author colon. Uh, but there's also, you know, sometimes machine readable stuff that goes into those headers. Um, in the case of the internet, uh, the protocol is actually pretty simple. There's a series of headers that uh, it, on a packet, and a packet is just sort of a chunk of data. And those headers uh, will say things like what, where the, where the packet is trying to go, who it's from, um, and some other information. And routers are, you know, they'll read those headers and then decide how to forward the packet based on what's in the header. So anytime I see a system that works as well as the internet um, leverage a, a pattern like that, I my my ears perk up. And then the web also is very similar. Like HTTP, uh, the standard is pretty simple. It's basically like a series of headers followed by anything at all. Uh, actually, and one of the headers is called content type, and it determines what actually how the stuff below should be interpreted. So the content type might be HTML, or it might be JavaScript, or it might be an image. So we see this emerge over and over. And, and actually, weirdly, uh, I discovered through Brian Arthur and John Holland, who are two sort of uh, evolutionary scientists, complexity scientists, that uh, this is also a pattern that we see in nature. If you look at our own genetics, this is so wild to me, it blows my mind. Uh, like genetics is just a string of, of DNA, right? Um, and, and so the question is sort of like, how, how, how does that DNA get interpreted as, as traits? One of the ways that this works is there are literal headers that have evolved within a strand of DNA to tell the, um, the, the DNA machinery, how to interpret the stuff that comes afterwards. So uh, 
I forget what they're called, but they're basically like sequences of repeating kind of um, genes uh, that almost sound like Morse code if you play them out. And it acts like a flag. It's like, okay, we're doing this now. Like this is an HTML file. This is an image file or whatever. You know, this is a feather. This is, these are teeth. These are eyeballs. Um, and I, this is fascinating to me, right? Like if evolution has evolved this solution for encoding information, maybe there's something here. Um, so that, that all kind of got me jazzed. And then I also kind of stumbled across the fact that if you look at um, the way people use Markdown, uh, especially when they use it for publishing websites, you'll often see that there are headers at the top. Uh, so Jekyll does this. This is like a, a website publisher. Um, I think so does Hugo. Like a, there are a bunch of different ones, right, that, for publishing websites. But they often have this kind of idea of metadata headers. Um, so then I was just like, I, I can't say no. Like, there's no way that this won't be useful. And I don't actually have a clear idea of how it should be used yet, um, but I'm gonna add it to the markup. So the basic idea will be that there will be a sequence of headers at the top followed by line-oriented markup underneath. Um, the other neat thing about that is it kind of gives me an escape hatch. So if the syntax becomes too limiting in the future or I want to add new content types to the system, I could introduce a content type header that sort of acts as a flag to change the way the stuff in the file should be interpreted. Um, so that is, that's, that's kind of the notion there. I'm pretty sure it'll look a lot like headers in, um, in Markdown that is like a three dashes followed by a series of headers followed by three dashes. So it's almost like they're kind of in a little box um, and, and it denotes that they're interpreted a little bit differently than the rest of the file. Yeah, um, easy to imagine that being really useful. Like, I know there's been a huge trend on, you know, Twitter certainly that there's like different kinds of content over time that they're sort of like clutching in. And uh, especially if you want something that can have different clients for the same kind of content to like have uh, variance in how, how, what kind of content is available or how it's parsed or presented or represented. That's like, Really, really cool to imagine. So, yeah, and I, I was reflecting on these tools that I use for study, like um, Mendeley or Zotero, or even something like iTunes, exists largely as basically a window to show metadata that has been set on a file. Um, so it is actually, I think, possible to set metadata on files in a lot of operating systems, but that metadata is hidden. It's like for computers only. Um, I think there's a lot of value in surfacing that to users and letting people do whatever they want with it. Um, in my notes, I might actually find that it's very useful to have some structured information in, in each note. Um, and it might be different depending on whether I'm a scientist or an artist or a writer, what kinds of things I want to put in that structured field. Um, another wild thing, sorry, just one other bit here is there's a way in which you can take a sequence of files that all have headers and interpret them as if they are a spreadsheet. And that is also compelling to me because spreadsheets are one of these tools that just have very open-ended sets of uses. In a lot of ways, the, our whole economy is sort of spreadsheet powered, which is a little bit terrifying, but it's one of these tools that's just like unreasonably useful, you know? So if I can kind of find a way to make my notes and your notes useful to, to, to us in these other tools that people use for so many other things, I, I think that's a win. Yeah, that, that definitely sounds really interesting. Um, I, I wanna step, take a step back and like talk about something like very broad of, um, you know, you mentioned this on the last conversation that we did and it's certainly peppered throughout your writing and, and this conversation as well, but um, I think it almost took me aback when you said this, you were like the evolution that, that the web has evolved, you know, uh, as like makes sense when you put it, but I think that there's a lot of implications there. And I want to just take some time to like hear from you about what the implications of the web being a system that's evolved are and how you think about that. Um, especially because it, it, it seems really crucial to your thinking process and your design process and the way you're structuring this product. So I'd be curious to hear from you, like, what are, what are the implications of the web being evolved? 
Oh my goodness, so many. This is one of these huge revolutionary moments in my life when I like started reading evolutionary textbooks. So actually I, I come from a religious background where like that is sort of like evolution is like, ah, it's not real, don't think about it, right? And when I found um, books like The Extended Phenotype or really the book that did it for me was, it's called Evolution in Four Dimensions. Uh, it's by MIT Press, a couple of scientists named Jablanka and, and Lamb. And they look at um, different ways in which systems evolve. And the interesting thing is that um, we think of evolution as a biological thing, like evolution is how you and I got here, right? And how that plant got the shape that it got and that sort of thing. But it's actually a general process that happens in a lot of different systems. Uh, we just don't think about this very often outside of biology, but um, any system that has three characteristics. So the three characteristics are mutation, heredity, and selection. So if you have mutation, heredity, selection, you get evolution. Uh, and it's actually pretty easy to satisfy these criteria. So you think about like, like um, something uh, like, uh, oh, let's see, uh, a lot of technologies work this way, actually, um, or even ideas. So uh, ideas, so mutation is like, I come up with a new idea based on the ideas that I've heard over the course of my life. Uh, heredity is I share that idea with you. Um, so there's like a continuity there. It gets propagated. It gets um, transferred from person to person. And selection is like some ideas are more interesting than others or maybe more useful than others. And so over time, those ideas bubble to the top. They might not actually be good ideas. Like there are some ideas that are very sticky. Um, Dawkins actually argued that religion is sort of like this, this like virus, you know, that lives in people's minds. I, I don't agree with this take, but uh, it's, it's an interesting thing to turn over in, in your head, right? Like that we have these ideas that are circulating in, in the milieu of culture and they're undergoing this selection process. And um, there are some similarities even between the way these biological systems work, like an ecosystem and the way ideas are propagated. Um, so the web is is evolved too, and it took me a little while to sort of um, realize this. But you get mutation in the in the uh, by way of standards changing, by way of new uh, products being built on top of the web. Uh, you get heredity by way of people reusing technologies, um, and you get selection uh, often through market pressure and and other things. Um, but what happens over time is like these evolved systems, you know, they're all different, but they have some, some patterns. Um, one of the patterns is, uh, uh, it's like this term of art that I've been borrowing a lot uh, called exaptation from biology. So this is the notion that things that exist uh, in, your, in your genes will often get repurposed for other things. So, um, if you think about it, evolution has to work with whatever already exists. It can't just, you know, sort of like leap and imagine something and then go and do it. It has to just sort of recombine stuff that already exists to create new things. So acceptation is 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 what happens when that happens. Like a good example of this is dinosaurs. They had feathers to regulate body temperature, but when the environment changed. Uh, evolution exacted feathers for flight. It found a new niche for uh, dinosaurs and they became birds. Um, but we see this a lot in tech too. Uh, technologies get exacted, um, sort of tilted toward other uses. Um, there's what another an example uh, of that in technology. Uh, I'm trying to, so the classic quote here is like William Gibson, the street finds its own uses for things. Um, in a lot of ways, maybe what I'm doing with subconscious is trying to exact old technology. Like, for example, what if I did build it on top of email? That's not a use case that emails creators ever thought about, you know, note taking. Um, but that would be a good example of exaptation, uh, kind of torquing old stuff in a new direction. We and talked also last time about um, Servo quite a bit, and you said that hmm. we talked about the history of that project, and you said that it had been sort of scrapped for parts into Firefox, would that be an example of ex exception? I think so, yeah. Um, that's, I guess, exaptation at the level of uh, the, the browser engine. 
Um, Servo is kind of interesting because in a lot of ways, what has happened is browser engines have co-evolved with web protocols. So the browser is sort of meant to be like a window onto these web protocols, right? And in the beginning, Tim Berners-Lee designed the protocols to be very simple to implement everywhere, but he also designed um, the markup to be very easy to display on a bunch of different contexts. So one of the reasons we still today talk on the web about separation of uh, presentation and content is that uh, this is sort of, it's almost like a, like a religious belief that outlasted the context in which it was developed. Um, Tim Berners-Lee developed it because the notion was that you should be able to display a web document on, on like a, uh, I think he actually built the first web browser on a Mac. So like, you know, in, on a graphical user interface like a Mac, but also back then things like DOS were really popular, you know, things that didn't have windowing systems or mice. And so the notion was that you could also display that same content just fine on a terminal um, or like even, even older technology. And that was one of the reasons the web spread. But what happened is over time, these uh, browsers gained features uh, because you know people wanted things like images and uh, people's browsing habits changed. Like they went from using terminals to using graphical user interfaces. And the, the change in the browser influenced the protocols, which influenced the browser, which influenced the protocols. So this is called like a co-evolutionary loop where two things in an environment get caught up with each other and start changing each other in this self-referential way. And in, in nature, we see this kind of thing a lot, like orchid moths, where there's like a certain flower that can only be pollinated by a certain moth and the certain moth can only eat the nectar of the certain flower. And it's like now they're almost like two parts of a of like a meta organism, I guess. And the same thing I think has happened a lot with the web. So it used to be very easy to kind of build a browser, easiest thing in the world actually. And a lot of people did, which is why the web spread. Uh, but then over time as this co-evolutionary loop kind of specialized both the protocols and the browser, it became incredibly difficult. So like now every browser is really a fork of an older browser so that, so that the evolutionary lineage can be maintained. And there's a ton of bugs in the, in the web rendering engines that are unspecified, but if you don't implement them, uh, the web doesn't work. So it's like they're de facto standards, but it's not actually possible to codify them. They're too fluid, if that makes sense. They're like emergent almost. That sounds um, both overwhelming and like exciting as a design space. And I'm getting the sense <laughs> that like um, you've just sort of internalize that into how you're building things pretty deeply. Like what, what is it like to build a product or think about building a product with this in mind? I guess uh, ambivalence is, is sort of an emotion that comes up a lot. I know that if I succeed to any degree, I'll end up in the same place that the web did. Like that's a success condition, not a failure condition. But I think there's beauty in it too. Um, Nature is the same way, you know, the Amazon rainforest is incredibly complex and there's a lot of interconnectedness there. And it, it has the same sort of difficulties. Like, for example, when we introduce invasive species into an ecosystem, it can cause the ecosystem to collapse or become a totally different ecosystem. There's all these like interconnections and interdependencies that are very difficult to reason about for human beings. And um, as engineers, we're sort of taught to modularize and compartmentalize and um, decompose problems. Uh, but that's a way of thinking that only works for a narrow range of problems. It's actually not a useful way of thinking about evolved systems like nature um, or even like the internet or the web. And, and to me, I, I actually think I've come all the way back around to gaining a sort of appreciation, hopefully humility for these kinds of systems. Um, I feel that as human beings, we've gotten to the stage where nearly everything we do is entangled with complex systems, evolved systems. Um, and we, I don't know, I think maybe we have to develop a sort of ecosystemic thinking. I, I sense that you have some thoughts here too, and I, I would love to hear them. Shucks. Uh, I was hoping to ask you more about that. Uh, <laughs> I mean, please. Um, yeah, um, hmm. 
Yeah, I, I, I just want to dive a little deeper into this because it seems like you've made a shift from this sort of like modular decompositional thinking to like a more systemic complex thinking in terms of how you're building things and approaching things. And um, what, what, how, what did that shift actually entail? And like, how would you help someone else make that similar shift? Um, yeah, that's a good question. You know, for me, I think reading these texts on evolution really caused a, a cascade of sort of changes in belief, changes in perspective in me. Um, this is some years ago. I don't know if that's something like, I don't know if they would have the same effect on everyone, right? It's like you come from a certain context, you are exposed to a totally different way of thinking and it, it changes you. Um, I, I, this might sound weird, but I feel like when I read about evolution or um, topics like cybernetics or ecology uh, or the way that natural ecosystems work, it's almost like a, a I think sometimes it can produce an almost spiritual headspace, like a kind of sense of, not transcendence exactly, but it's like, I don't know, these emergent processes, they are in some sense, something bigger than, than what a human mind can wrap itself around. Um, that's pretty cool to me, you know, I, and all, it's given me this appreciation for the fact that we're, we're, we're all, we're part of the system, right? Not outside of it, not controlling it, but we're woven into it. We're part of the loop. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I get this, this really like, um, hmm. I'm sure there's a good word for this, but it's, it's like a, it's like a sense of, of beauty, I guess, when I look at these systems, even though they're messy, like they shouldn't, you know, for, as from an engineer's perspective, they should be sort of offensive, uh, but there is something living about them. It seems like one of the things that I see you doing is um, from the way that you're talking about is like one studying things that have worked, uh, whether it's bodies or the environment or technologies and like understanding why they've worked and in their complexity, like what the history of it is and kind of being like an archaeologist that's like, how did this evolve in this way? Like you're talking about looking up the internet standards and reading the task force documents and then on the other hand, it's like it, that. So that's like just an open ended curiosity of like, how did it work? Uh, and then there's also this sort of like mind of, okay, if this worked elsewhere, how do I adapt it to work in this new thing that I'm building? And like, what can I sort of ape and build and integrate into this yeah. thing so that it's likely to succeed as well? Is that a fair description? Absolutely. Yeah, I'm better than I could do. I, I think this first clicked with me when I started reading Christopher Alexander. Uh, famous architect. He wrote a book called The Pattern Language, but he has this kind of, um, well, as I understand Christopher Alexander, he rejects uh, ideological approaches to design. So ar architecture is very ideological. It's very ideas oriented. And Alexander, basically his take was, we have these forms of architecture, usually traditional, that have evolved within local contexts to find evolutionary fit and like holism, like a holistic fit within their context. And that almost, I feel like he reframes the role of a designer as, as like a field biologist, you know? Uh, like someone who's going around a rainforest and trying to understand the connections between, you know, the moth and the orchid. And I like that to me is so beautiful. And it was so different from the kind of high modernist design kind of perspective that I had, that, that had first gotten me into the space, right? Like Corbusier and the, like the modernist design, Paul Rand, like all these kinds of like wonderful in their own way, almost sort of um, uh, machine oriented designers in, of the 20th century. Like they thought about the world like a, like a well-ordered machine and I, you know, it's like that kind of thinking can get us pretty far. I think it has value. Um, it's not that it doesn't, it's just that it feels like almost like we've gotten to this, this place uh, where it, the territory that we've gotten to is beyond the range uh, uh, that that type of approach can solve. And um, yeah, encountering Alexander was, was pivotal for me. Um, and 
and honestly, like it, he's he's basically like an ecologist of architecture. You you start to read ecology papers, and it's like very similar perspectives, and a, and a humility too. It's like you're inside the system, trying to understand it rather than outside, um, dictating what it should look like. If that makes sense. Yeah, as you talk about this, um, yeah, I'll I'll come back to what you asked about. You you said like what thoughts do I have about this? And it's sort of crystallizing as you speak of like, mm. when I'm really lucky on in person or on Twitter or on this podcast, I have a sense of, um, and there's different flavors of it, but a sense of um, higher order collective thinking being possible, mm. where like, um, you know, it's less like you are thinking about something and doing something and I am learning about it. It's like we are co-creating something together and uh, you have information, I have information and uh, like patterns of thought, like the ones that you put on your website that are sort of like playing together and that if there's enough shared context and like trust and presence and things like that, that it, it becomes possible to um, dance with that together and really play together and um yeah i think that's that's sort of like a guiding star for me and in a lot of realms of human interaction of like what what could we possibly do together if we're um have that shared context and understanding yeah you know i'm going to get really out of my depth here too and just say for the first time in my life i've picked up a couple of uh buddhist texts and mm. been completely floored to see what to me seem like similar perspectives being expressed like dependent origination and sort of this idea of like mutual rising um, or even I guess this is not strictly Buddhism but like the concept of Indra's net that everything mm -hmm. is sort of interconnected with everything and if you sort of if you take the ecologist's view uh, this is literally true in some sense I there isn't a way in which myself uh, ends at the boundary of my skin. It's like I breathe air, which has been provided to me by plants. And, you know, they also rely on the water cycle, which is part, like really, we're all just part of this tapestry uh, mm -hmm. wrapped around this little bubble floating in space. Um, and <laughs> I know I'm getting pretty far afield mm -hmm. from like the web and technology, but um, yeah, I guess this has just been a sort of journey and perspective for me. and. I'm heartened to see that I, I think some of these perspectives can be backported all the way back to technology and maybe give us a different set of priors, like a different set of assumptions that we can bring to the design of systems. Um, maybe it'll end up producing something better. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I mean, um, I am definitely sympathetic to those ways of seeing things, obviously. and. Uh, mm. I think that uh, the kinds of practices that I've done, like contemplative practices, are the conditions for experiencing these kinds of things directly, like phenomenologically. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, that shapes up differently for different people. So I, I only have my experience of it, but like it's really lovely to see the same kinds of um, experiences and shifts happening in seemingly unrelated fields. Like I, I never thought just as a banal example, like that, like, hmm. I mean, it, talking about Twitter is like very much a recurring theme on this podcast because I think it's um, probably still underrated as like a, a collective form of, of reasoning and connection. And I mm -hmm. see so much more being possible there, but like, yeah, I think that's um, that and, and technology more broadly are, are it's possible to see the same kinds of things and it's it's heartening to, to kind of hear it coming from the the other perspective as well yeah um i mean to put it even more um boldly like oh like when i talk to someone like you um or read things that other people wrote it feels like thinking together and um certainly yeah. when we actually have these conversations it feels like we are thinking together and um um, you know, uh, something I think about a lot is, I, I don't know if you ever saw the um, ad from, I think it was in the 2000s from IBM about Linux. Did you ever see that with like a little, a little boy? No. 
I think about this all the time. It's like a one minute ad and it's, um, it was an ad for IBM's Linux product at the time, but um, it was like this little boy and um, it's a series of, he, he's, he's like quiet the whole time and just like is listening to a series of adults that come and talk to him about different things. So there's like an airplane pilot and an engineer and like a Latin scholar and like all kinds of like a soccer player and all kinds of different experts in their fields. And they say like these like pithy one sentence things about uh, whatever it is that they're an expert in. And you get the sense that he's like, they talk at the end, it sort of zooms out to like two people that are like watching this boy and they're they're like he's learning so much and there's like what's his name and it's like Linux you know <laughs> and uh, yeah I, I feel like that sometimes insofar as um, both for myself but I, I think more broadly of like um, yeah I mean when I have this podcast it's like I, I ask interesting people to come on and I talk to them about interesting things and then the information comes in and then there's like a learning there that happens and other people are listening as well and there's um uh, sort of like a synthesis of information and spreading of information that happens over time where, uh, and that's collective, like it happened, I experience it because I'm in the podcast, but other people that listen to it have it. And this is just like a, a, a microcosm of the larger thing on the internet for sure. Um, yeah. So it gets into kind of, yeah, like trippy, trippy headspace for sure. Um, yeah. Yeah. To track back to your one of your earlier questions about mm -hmm. what, what does it mean for the web to be evolved and 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 maybe to tie a bow on on this um, this thread is is uh, I I think one shift in perspective that these kinds of evolutionary views on things or ecological views on things has given me is uh, if you're trying to create something new like the web. Um, I don't think you want to approach it by um, building the system all at once. Uh, Christopher Alexander has this nice quote, if you want a living flower, you don't build it, you grow it from the seed. And I think that's so true. You, it's like a different way of designing where you have to build not the thing, but the seed of a thing and, uh, and then let it grow. And in some ways, it, this means relinquishing control. You're not like an architect viewing things from space, putting everything in, you know, in, in an arrangement that you want it to be in. Um, if your goal is to build something like a living, open-ended, evolvable system, you want to start with something really small. And uh, that actually is kind of empowering to me. Uh, it's also empowering to think that something like the web was created by a couple of people on nights and weekends. Um, so it's, it's really about like, how do you build these small seeds and what kinds of things have the potential to grow? You know, not everything that's seed shaped can grow. Like if you put a pebble in dirt and nothing's gonna happen. So there's like some chemistry that has to be there, right? And I think what I'm trying to do with my writing and reading is figure out what that chemistry is. Um, I guess we'll find out <laughs> if I have any clue <laughs> what I'm talking about, uh, whether or not this works. Um, but it's a good learning experience. Definitely, definitely. I, I, interestingly, like as you build it, it seems like it puts you in a position to really understand trends. In like you're trying to build a note product that does something new, but you're also really well positioned to understand a lot of like bigger trends from the way that you're going about it. Um, yeah, I, I'd be curious to ask about some of those. Like you, you made some claims that. I'm not sure I quite understood from the newsletter. And so I would love to go kind of one by one and hear you talk about some of these. Um, so um, yeah, maybe one that's sort of adjacent to what we're talking about is you said that technology evolves compositionally. And what, what does that mean? Yeah, this is actually not my idea. It is um, from W. Brian Arthur of the Santa Fe Institute. He's a economist and complexity scientist who's done a lot of uh, fundamental research on this topic. So he started with the insight sort of similar to the one that I mentioned that evolution happens in, in systems other than biology, right? Mutation, heredity, selection. Uh, so he was sort of thinking about technology and, um, and was asking himself if technology evolves, how does it evolve? Uh, he wrote a really good book by, uh, about this called The Nature of Technology recommend it, super accessible. Um, 
And uh, his put is that technologies, if you look at the shape of a technology, it's kind of recursive. Like if you take something like a clock or a car apart, you'll see that inside of it are other components like an engine, right? And inside of that are other components like a piston. And it it's like that all the way down. So it's almost like this set of, uh, like a tree almost, uh, not necessarily strictly a tree, but it's this sort of bundling of components to create something that we think of as a technology. Um, so that's kind of interesting. And uh, one of the things that he sort of, uh, discovered or I guess argues for is that these components act almost like genes in the evolutionary process. So, you know, technology doesn't have DNA, uh, there, but there has to be some mechanism by which heredity happens. And, and he would say that that's through components. So um, you can take this, a set of components, put it together, uh, create one thing like a car, you might take a similar set of components, create a different thing. So, uh, I don't know, lithium ion battery plus four wheels plus a chassis, you get an electric car. Lithium ion battery plus two wheels plus a set of pedals, you get an electric bike. Uh, but many of the components that went into those two very different technologies are, are similar. It's like they share genes. Uh, so where do the genes come from? Um, they, they have to have some sort of process by which they are evolved. And his argument is that uh, there's actually a process that happens in the market. So a technology is introduced. Uh, it is um, introduced as a product usually. And uh, products are, are kind of interesting. They're like these integrations of components that tend to command pretty good returns. Like they make, they're, they're not commodities, right? They tend to make good profits. But then what happens is over time that new technology becomes well understood and other entrants come in, they copy the technology, they often modularize it and they sell it for cheaper. So then the technology becomes commoditized and in the process, it also becomes componentized. So it's like that technology, which was made up of components itself over time becomes a component, which can then be pieced together into another technology and the same process can happen again. So you, that's where you get this recursive shape. Um, and it also means that technology evolves at higher and higher levels of abstraction. Like the components that we're gluing together to create these technologies are doing more and more complex things. So um, you could probably, and this is me just hand waving, but if you look at like, you know, one of these charts of like uh, technological growth, you'll see like, ah, nothing happens for like 100,000 years and then you know, maybe there's like a bump around the Bronze Age. It's like, oh, cool, we figured out iron and bronze and like a few things, maybe some water wheels. Uh, and there's like a really like obvious sort of takeoff that happens a few hundred years ago. And it's, you know, I, I this is me interpreting, but it's almost like, hey, we have more and more of these genes circulating. We're composing them at higher and higher levels and the evolution is happening faster and faster. It's almost like a Cambrian explosion kind of a thing. Um, so, uh, that's, that's his notion about how technology, uh, develops and evolves. And it's been really influential for me as I, as I think through, um, tech in general, I think, um, maybe we can get to this, but I, I think what's interesting about the internet is it's produced a set of technologies that refuse to evolve. They've actually broken the evolutionary loop of technology. Yeah, that was one of the claims I wanted to ask you about, actually, because you said that you devoted a whole piece to this saying aggregators aren't open ended. And I think that was the one that you talked about that with. And um, can can you just um, maybe I think that was one of the pieces that I found more difficult to understand. So could you would you mind sort of making that argument verbally for me? <laughs> I'll do my best. So this is like when I was saying I have this bad habit of sort of giving 10 minutes of of back history before I get to the point. Mm -hmm. uh, this piece is me doing that. I'm colliding a couple different theories and seeing if anything comes out of that mm -hmm. sort of particle accelerator. Mm -hmm. So one is this idea of open-ended evolution. Um, this is something that was developed by uh, complexity scientists like Kenneth Stanley, John Holland. Uh, the idea is that uh, you look at something like nature and uh, nature keeps changing. Evolution is never done. 
And this is kind of a really interesting thing because most processes that you can point to, they have like a sort of equilibrium state. Like if you put a marble in a bowl, it'll whoop, 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 you know, and produce a bunch of interesting variations on its state, but eventually it settles at the bottom of the bowl and it stops changing. Um, nature doesn't do that. It keeps disrupting itself. Uh, and so they call that open-ended evolution. And it's a surprisingly difficult, actually, it's surprisingly difficult phenomenon to recreate. When we simulate evolution in computers, uh, often the evolution will produce variation for a while and then get stuck. And, and, and like just reproduce the same epiphenomena over and over. And we don't know why. Um, so there's this whole area of study about that, right? But there are systems we can point to that seem to be open-ended. Uh, nature is one, markets are another, which is kind of interesting, you know, that I think capitalism has a lot of problems, but there's also a lot of ways in which it's very resilient because it's evolving and evolvable. Um, technology is another, like there's no last technology that we know of, um, at least not yet. <laughs> I guess we could stop the process by blowing ourselves up, but that's a little bit different than what they're getting at, right? Like in the same way an asteroid could hit the, the earth and nature could stop, uh, but the system itself left to its own devices will keep producing new outcomes. Um, the internet seems to be open-ended and, and maybe the web too, uh, and people are as well. So a nice cheat for creating an open-ended system is to add people to the mix, uh, which I think is very beautiful. Um, so that's kind of the notion of open-ended evolution. So when I say aggregators are not open-ended, that's like point number one. That's what open-ended means. Uh, aggregators. Aggregators are like a term of art in software business theory. Um, there was a theorist named Ben Thompson who is developing this theory. And the basic idea is that the internet has produced a new kind of monopoly. Uh, called an aggregator. So old style monopolies are like where you have a factory and a bunch of money and success. And you basically leverage your monopoly on supply uh, to extract money from demand. So it's like, hey, I'm the only factory that produces car tires. So you're probably gonna want a car tire. I'm gonna charge you a thousand dollars per tire. You know, um, that's an old style monopoly. Aggregators are kind of uh, the other way around. So, and this has to do with the way the internet works. They what they do is they leverage a monopoly on demand, which is usually the, in the form of users or eyeballs, to, commodit to commoditize supply, which is often people who create content. Like, I guess um, on YouTube, uh, you are supply because you're creating podcasts and that's what makes YouTube go around, right? Um, so uh, some examples of this, uh, Facebook is an aggregator, it leverages uh, user demand, so basically all the people that use Facebook, to commodify supply, which are often content creators, people who produce news, that sort of thing. Like Facebook is making the lion's share of profit there, and those other people don't have a lot of leverage in that ecosystem. Um, another example might be like Uber. Uber leverages rider demand, uh, which it's managed to aggregate all in one place in order to commodify the supply of drivers. So drivers have to accept pretty, you know, meager uh, marginal uh, profits because that's where all the riders are. Um, so the, the way in which aggregators work is they, they're leveraging something that's sort of intrinsic to the internet. So the internet is a giant global network. Uh, and that means you can sort of start to build network effects, um, which basically means like the more people who use a network, the more valuable the network gets. And this creates this snowball effect. So if you can get that off the ground, you pretty quickly have like a position of power that you can leverage. Um, the other thing that aggregators are leveraging is uh, that software is zero marginal cost to copy uh, or to scale. So in, in a sense, adding one more user to Facebook or YouTube costs approximately nothing. Like it, it's some fractional, 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 fractional bit of a penny. Um, traditionally, like, network effects uh, like the, the old school AT&T telephone monopoly were they had a sort of natural rate limit like a friction which was that um, it was not zero marginal cost to add more users like they had to go and build new telephone lines to reach a new part of the country so it was actually much harder back then to create a monopoly 
uh, and, and it's much easier now, it's basically like if you get in there first, you have a really good shot. And um, we see this happening all over the world. Like we've, we have our own monopolists here in the US and they've extended their reach to other parts of the world, but there are also similar sort of Facebook style monopolists in other parts of the world that are almost uh, like they've consolidated regions. Uh, I think WeChat in China is an obvious one. Gojek is another one in Southeast Asia. Um, so that's what an aggregator is. Uh, so, okay, so open-ended evolution aggregators. My claim is that aggregators cannot produce open-ended evolution. They they aren't like the internet or the web in that they can't evolve. And um, the reason is, is that uh, they don't want to be commoditized. And when I talked earlier about how te technology evolves uh, through composition, um, that, that sort of componentization process actually commoditizes you. It means that when you, at, by the time you become a component that's easy to plug into some other technology, you've lost the ability to leverage your position to make extra profits. You basically lost your monopoly position. Um, so they don't want that, uh, aggregators don't. And they have a unique set of um, tools that they can leverage to prevent their own commoditization. Basically they use network effect um, to, to sort of uh, prevent uh, new entrants from creating alternatives. So I could create an alternative to Facebook today, but it would have exactly one person on it, me, and that's just not very compelling, right? Like you're probably going to go to uh, facebook.com because that's where all your friends are. Um, and, and in the few cases that there have been real challengers like Instagram, uh, these aggregators have bought them out. Um, usually the challengers happen through some asymmetric strategy. It's like, hey, we're not gonna be about posts. We're gonna be about images, you know, that was the Instagram angle. And that gave them like just enough of a competitive wedge that they could get in there and start that snowball effect. Um, so this is kind of where we're at, right? Is, is basically aggregators have frozen the evolutionary loop of technology because they don't want to get commoditized. They don't want to get componentized. And um, it means that like, we have this weird kind of uh, situation where all of these aggregators have been built on top of technologies that were componentizable. Um, so if you can build Facebook on top of the web, if you're, you know, if you're Mark Zuckerberg starting the startup, you build Facebook on top of the web. Uh, if there were a Mark Zuckerberg today, it wouldn't be possible for that person to create a web on top of Facebook. Like Facebook is somehow fundamentally less expressive than the web was. So it's, it's almost like we've sort of deliberately limited the range of, of things the technology can do in order to maintain control of the system and maintain a, a profitable monopoly position. Um, <laughs> I feel bad because that was, man, a no, lot of backstory. No, that's, that that's all, great. Does that all scan? It does. Um... I, I gotta yeah, I say wanna... too, this is a hypothesis. So like, sure. this is me colliding a couple different theories and coming to a conclusion that feels right to me. And I'm very open to pushback, you know? So I, uh, there might be a hole in my in my perspective here. I'm, no, I'm it, not totally... it, it does seem right to me. And I, I wanna ask about a particular case as well, but let me first um, clarify. I imagine that you're using evolution in the technical term here insofar as to say like it, it wouldn't be the case for example that the aggregators don't change they definitely change but they don't evolve you say so could, could you talk about what the difference is there yeah um so i guess it is possible that the aggregator can change within the confines of, of like what is facebook.com facebook can hire engineers they can modify facebook um, but any change that's happening is happening within the context of a single company and a single product. So you get this sort of funny effect where every single product has to copy every single feature of every single other product. Like, oh, we invented this new thing called stories. Well, okay, now Facebook has stories and Twitter has stories and everyone has stories. Uh, or there's this new thing on the block called Clubhouse. And it's like, okay, now Twitter has Clubhouse and Facebook has Clubhouse and Discord has Clubhouse. And it, so it's like, <laughs> there's this old joke in 
programmer land called Zawinski's law, which is like every app uh, evolves until it implements email. So it's, it's like we're in this weird, funny world where like it's like Zawinski's law, but for everything, like everyone is trying to be the operating system that does literally everything in your life. Um, and, and actually there is, I think, existence proof that it can end up there. Uh, WeChat, that's exactly what happened in China. It's basically the everything operating system. Um, mm. I, you know, that that's a thing that can happen. Uh, it's within the realm of possibility. I kind of feel like that's not the best outcome for innovation, for privacy, uh, for a bunch of reasons. Um, so I, I think it is actually pretty beneficial to allow um, multiple technologies to compete, multiple products to compete. I think we get more interesting outcomes when that happens. It seems to me that a lot of the aggregators really only innovate when they're threatened by someone from the outside. Like, oh no, there's a new thing called Clubhouse. Let's try to copy it. They usually do it pretty badly too. And the reason is that they have a set of incentives. Uh, like every organization is like a is, is like a creature with a particular metabolism. And it's like the startup is like, hey, I'm Excel, I eat grass. And this old aggregator is like a lion and it's like, I eat grass now too, right? <laughs> it's just like, eh, this isn't working as well as it should. Um, so I, you know, I, my sense is that evolution is more generative and more productive if there's a, if there's greater diversity within the ecosystem. Um, but you're right, like change does happen within the context of a company. I just think it's bound by the particular local incentives of that company. So the range of motion is much smaller mm -hmm. for evolution in that context. Yeah, it seems like those are the two key things there of like one, there's like sort of these uh, like singular products or that are, that are just like on their own. And then um, where there is competition, they just like mimic each other and reproduce the same things wholeheartedly rather than like diverging in functionality or something like that. Is, is that a good summary of what you're saying? That's my sense. Yeah. And that's been my experience, I guess, mm -hmm. uh, working in, in a big tech. Um, mm -hmm. It's a very sort of like optimizing mindset, you know, product managers at big tech companies, they're kind of calibrating on charts that are like, they want to see them go up and to the right. And it's a lot about kind of um, doing well understood things that will are known to create that nice up and to the right line shape. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so there's mm -hmm. not like a lot of de novo generative thinking. There's not a lot of like investment and research and development. There's a little bit of that stuff, um, but it often struggles to get to market. You look at something like, you know, Microsoft Research uh, or, or like the, you know, the investment that maybe a Google or Facebook has done in something like VR. And sometimes they do actually produce new uh, technologies, but the incentives of the company are often in conflict with, um, with the thing that that technology wants to be. And so it ends up shuttered. Occasionally we get lucky and they sort of produce a piece of uh, DNA, I guess, technological DNA that gets exapted by someone else, right? Mm -hmm. and, and they run off with it and do something with it. Mm -hmm. um, but that's rare is my sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would be curious to hear you describe a specific situation in this lens. Um, I'm thinking in particular of Twitter and like, we talked earlier about Mastodon and I've had on the show, I've mentioned to you this kind of like Twitter alternative spiel that I think is really interesting. And I know actually oh, yeah. that Twitter has um, like its own, uh, like I think it's called like Blue Sky or something where they're trying to do something mm -hmm. in the space of like reproduce Twitter, but in a mo more open way. I, I don't really know what's going on with that. Mm -hmm. um, but I would be curious to describe like, hear you describe how, how you see at the very least, like Twitter versus Mastodon and what's happening there yeah. with, from this perspective. Yeah, I guess I'm going to describe both of them as someone from the outside with a bit of a beginner's mind. Um, so Mastodon, as I understand it, is it, it is kind of like a Twitter clone in some ways. But the notion is that instead of one website called Twitter.com that everyone has to go to, anyone can sort of run this software on a server of their choosing. Um, that's a little bit of a tall order. It's like installing your own WordPress software. So not everyone can do it, but it's, you know, it's a Ruby on Rails app. I think there are a lot of engineers that have that kind of experience and they can go purchase a server and install this software and run it. And a few people have. I think there's a pretty, um, uh, it seems like actually a pretty diverse kind of 
set of servers running this, this Mastodon uh, software. Uh, they call it the Fediverse. And, and actually, it's kind of interesting. Mastodon built itself on top of a protocol that had been in development for years and was kind of like, at least from my perspective, a little bit abandoned. Maybe I'm getting that wrong, but to me, it seemed like the, uh, this is not really a thing people did. It was called New Social, GNU Social. It was part of this, you know, GNU, new um, open source movement. And uh, what Mastodon did is it built a really beautiful user experience around that protocol. And there were some older tools that ran the protocol too. So they all they all work together. Uh, a little bit like email, right? Like I can email you on your email address, even if it's on a different provider. Um, so that's pretty cool. I think uh, you mentioned Twitter is is ex investigating something similar. I I don't know much about it. I do uh, know of Jay Graber, who's the head of that project right now, and she is a well-known peer-to-peer and distributed systems developer. Um, really has done some phenomenal work. Uh, <laughs> My read on it, and this is totally from the outside, is just that, that Jack Dorsey is kind of a wild card, and he is just like, I'm going to fund this thing, and I'm not totally sure if it's like a vanity project or if it's uh, if he's serious about it. It seems to me to be a little bit at odds with the business model of Twitter. Um, but yeah, you know, sometimes people make decisions that are plot twists, and I think either way, the work that the people are doing on Blue Sky is probably going to generate some interesting plot twists, some some nice sort of technological DNA, if you will. Um, but uh, you know, a, a challenge, I guess, with um, Mastodon and and other efforts to kind of bootstrap distributed systems is there. All of us, including myself, who's trying to do something similar, we're fighting against network effects of established incumbents. Um, so it probably would have been pretty easy to bootstrap something like Mastodon before Twitter existed, if that were possible. Um, it's it's an uphill battle now, but I think they've done pretty well. And uh, a lot of it, to me, seems to have coincided with scandals at Twitter uh, around content moderation, you know, Nazis on Twitter, and people just get sick of it and they exit, you know, to, to Mastodon. So I am so grateful to the people who work on that for developing an alternative. Mm -hmm. I think. Um, They've struggled, it seems to me, from again, from the outside, not an expert, but like with uh, uh, spam and other sort of similar issues. These tend to be an issue on distributed systems. You know, email, I think, had a big spam problem. Uh, to some degree, email solved the problem through re-centralizing, which is a little depressing, but it tends to be easier to swat down stuff you don't like if there's one you know, nominally like someone who's in control of the system who can say no. And that's something centralized systems are able to do that decentralized systems might have a harder time doing. Like, uh, but, but to some degree too, it seems Mastodon is solving this problem through having boundaries of trust. So there might be Mastodon servers where they're invite only. And uh, I, I actually, I think this is a really beautiful solution. It's not the total solution, but it's like a relocalization. And um, as human beings, it seems like we work together really well in small groups, just naturally. Um, there's actually an anthropologist named Robert Dunbar who, who coined an idea, Dunbar's number, which is basically like, we do great all the way until 150 people. And at 150 people, our brain stops being able to keep track of personal relationships. And then you get all sorts of like uh, unfortunate things that emerge. People fight more. Also, sociopaths can sort of become endemic because they, they don't get kicked out because people can't keep track of who's trustworthy. So things just become harder when they become big. And um, there's a cool way in which stuff like Mastodon, I think, is making space for smaller communities. Uh, I, I, I love that, personally. <laughs> That's a really interesting perspective on it. Um... Yeah, I'm happy to hear how you're thinking about that because um, I guess in the back of my head is like, you know, I, I touched on this earlier, but like as, as sort of central to Twitter is in terms of like the way that I think and learn and explore the world and interact with others socially. Like um, I'm also like acutely aware of its limitations and things I don't like about it. And I would love for it to be, um, yeah, replaced by something that was um, having more of the properties that you're talking about rather than like an aggregator um, so that there was 
you know, um, competition and diversity and like uh, federation, like you're talking about, or like local pods or um, different ways yeah. of like interacting with the system and things like that. Um, you know, one more thought on that. Mm. I think it seems today that aggregators have won the day because of the network effect advantages. But I kind of wonder if this might be like, we're looking at too narrow a window in time. I sort of suspect that perhaps decentralized technologies and more, more localized technologies might have staying power, also open source, um, in ways that aggregators don't. Like, I'm not totally certain if Facebook will exist in 20 years. You know, MySpace is gone, and that seemed mm -hmm. unstoppable at one point. Mm -hmm. um, I suspect email will be here in 20 years. There's mm -hmm. something that's lindy about it. Like, people hate it, but it also just works, and mm -hmm. it, it's you know, pretty reliable. Um, so there's like a time function here that is, you know, the jury's out, but it seems like maybe there is something about uh, these open systems, distributed systems having more resiliency and more longevity. Um, certainly they should be more resilient in principle because there's no single point of failure. Uh, but I guess, you know, it remains to be seen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's really hard to predict these things too. Um, and yet, I would be curious to ask for some predictions. Um, <laughs> in particular, uh, there are some trends that are happening very broadly, certainly outside of just the note taking space in particular. Um, that, yeah, I don't think anyone understands completely well yet, and certainly I don't understand well yet. Yeah. So I would love to hear you talk, uh, maybe just to start about this movement of Web3 and what you're seeing there to the extent that you understand it right now. Yeah, this is a really interesting thing. So again, I'm gonna have to say, I am going to approach this with beginner's mind as an outsider who is technical, but is like new to this space mm -hmm. and just offer my, my view of it. So don't treat it as definitive, but mm -hmm. as far as I can tell, Web3 is sort of this catch-all umbrella term for a bunch of different stuff, which is I guess unified by the fact that it's kind of coming from a very weird set of principles and, and incentives as compared to the kind of aggregator software as a service software ecosystem of big tech. Um, so within the umbrella of Web3, I've seen things called Web3 uh, like cryptocurrency, NFTs, uh, but also things like peer-to-peer -peer networks, which have nothing to do with cryptocurrency. Uh, maybe new attempts to reboot the web um, and uh, protocols like IPFS or DAT. And um, so it's, it's like a fuzzy term. Uh, and it also it, to me feels like a scene um, in the sort of Brian Eno sense. It's like, there's a bunch of interesting people doing interesting things. We know not why, like nobody's quite clear in their heads of what we're up to, but there's like some scene forming, right? And a lot of cool things happening and, uh, and a lot of interesting developments brewing. Um, so, so yeah, what, what is Web3? I guess I would probably qualify subconscious as Web3. Um, I don't think or know if that includes cryptocurrency. I think for me, like I'm, I'm most interested in the sort of distributed protocols end of that spectrum. Um, there are weird ways in which, uh, I think one struggle that peer-to-peer -peer and decentralized efforts have had is there's no economic flywheel there. Um, you're basically, uh, you know, all, all the profits are in big tech. You're quitting the world and hopefully you can keep a roof over your head while you write software. Open source software has ca carved out a niche for itself um, doing this, you know, partly I think because uh, it, it survives on starvation rations, like it survives on the bones that like big tech throws in its direction. Um, and, uh, but like a lot of distributed tech, peer-to-peer -peer protocols and stuff, there's no interest really from a lot of aggregators in developing this stuff. It's diametrically opposed to their business model. It's more complicated from an engineering perspective. They're just kind of like, why would you do this, right? But from my perspective as a user, I'm like, why would I want to own my files and my data? Why would I want privacy? Like, of course I want those things, right? It's like, it seems valuable to 
you know, even if you're not like a maximalist, it seems valuable to have a space of solutions that embody some of those principles. Um, so I don't know, I, I guess uh, I've been trying to process this too, because I, I get queasy feelings about cryptocurrency and all the scams, but at the same time I recognize this is kind of weird that it's injecting a bunch of economic energy into this sort of thing. And we see like Ethereum experimenting with funding public goods, usually open source software through um, through stuff like smart contracts. So like mechanized kind of almost like a mechanized nonprofit, like a nonprofit as software. Um, weird experiments like this or um, other experiments like what if we replace corporations with some sort of software that kind of grants people tokens like nominal money for work that they do um, or other experiments like uh, yeah I guess it's been used as a fundraising mechanism so um, uh, interesting one is uh, Filecoin so there's this distributed protocol called IPFS which is like it's peer-to-peer -peer. the notion is we get rid of servers altogether and everyone on the network is just a peer like Tashin you're looking for a particular website I happen to have visited that website so my computer hands you the file and anyone on the network can serve that function. So like there's a challenge with these distributed systems in that in people's interests in files or in content tends to be very spiky. Like if you've ever run a web a, a website, you see this happen, right? Like maybe you show up on Hacker News one day and it's like, oh no, suddenly there's a hundred thousand people. Uh, but like for months before that and for months after that, there's like zero visitors, right? And this is just kind of the way that networks work. they are like huge spikes and then large periods of quiet. So if you're building a network where the notion is that everyone is sort of voluntarily exchanging files, there's a problem of like, what if stuff just disappears because people lose interest, but like it should still be there. We want access to it. So you need to keep stuff alive. Um, and what IPFS did is they developed a sort of an interesting cryptocurrency called Filecoin, which instead of being based on proof of work or other things like this, it's based on proof of storage. So the notion is that if you dedicate your part of your hard drive space to hosting other people's content, you will be rewarded to the extent that you dedicate hard drive space. This is an interesting idea, right? It's still getting off the ground. Um, it will be interesting to see if there aren't economies of scale that end up re-centralizing all that stuff into server farms anyway, but what a crazy attempt, right? And the cool thing was that um, they did a kind of token raise. Um, so they were like, hey, we're going to have this Filecoin token and people paid real money to access the token under the idea that at some point, uh, hopefully you should be able to use those tokens to purchase hard drive space. Honestly, a lot of it's probably goodwill, right? Um, maybe a lot of it's speculation, like people just hoping to make a quick buck. Um, but either way, uh, it's changed something about the chemistry for better and worse of, of the sort of decentralized system space. You know, it's a, a space that was starving for capital for a long time, and now there's this injection of mostly speculative capital. From my perspective, um, the <laughs> I, I think it's a bubble, but if you look at economic theorists like Carlotta Perez, um, most technology progresses by way of bubbles. So the bubble funds infrastructure, then it pops, then there's like a trough of disillusionment. And then, but what's left behind is the infrastructure and people can start solving real problems with what like, <laughs> with what's left behind in the rubble. And this is like an unfortunate byproduct of the way capitalism works, but it's like a thing that happens, right? So maybe this is happening now, I don't know. Um, I think uh, <laughs> uh, the kind of infrastructure that might get left behind seems to me to be infrastructure around payments and infrastructure around accounts and identity. And both those things seem really important to me because they both require a high degree of trust and they both have very strong centralizing effects. So if you look at aggregators today, a lot of them are built around one of the, like one or both of those sort of trust uh, mechanisms, right? So like Facebook has leveraged its position to create Facebook Connect, which now a lot of other websites use. So 
it's because people trust Facebook to manage their identity. Um, likewise, payments, like payments are like, hey, there's Apple Pay, there's PayPal, there's Stripe, there's maybe a couple others, but like you can count them on your fingers because uh, there's, you know, you need to be able to trust uh, to exchange money. And if we have decentralized solutions for these things, um, who knows, there might actually be a, like a fly flywheel by which uh, the kind of uh, set of incentives that cause people to sit at one of those high points and create a castle and extract rent, maybe that evaporates, like maybe castles become less important and, and maybe there's like more kind of um, exchange between peers. Um, I think a lot has to go right for that to happen, but I would say it's, it's injecting a lot of weird energy into the web space. And I think it's significant that the set of incentives around decentralization and around Web3 and around crypto are all completely, as far as I can tell, incompatible with the business model of something like Facebook. So it's definitely, it's asymmetric. And that's one of the things you wanna look for when you're sort of trying to spot the next technological revolution. Um, is there anywhere that you'd suggest that someone uh, like start poking or exploring in this space if they're interested in learning more about it based on what you've seen? Yeah, I um, I really like what IPFS has done. It's kind of fun if you're into the web, if you're into tech to play around with it. You just install this little thing and it lets you publish files or, or get files um, by a long string of characters. So what actually happens is there's a math function where it takes the file, turns it into a hash, which is just a long string of letters and numbers. But the cool thing is that that hash is unique to the file, which means if I do it and if you do it, we both get the same, the same sort of URL out, out the other end. So no matter where the file lives, um, IPFS finds a way to go and grab it and, and give it to you. And this is kind of a fun, you know, like foundational technology to play with. I think it's gonna probably play an important part in subconscious. Like I could imagine if you want to publish your, your notes and share them, it would make a lot of sense to publish them to IPFS uh, because it's both distributed and it's more permanent and resilient than the web in principle. Um, so that, that seems fun. Um, <laughs> just because I'm a con like a, a risk averse person, I'm not the person who's gonna go tell you to go speculate on cryptocurrencies. <laughs> like, I feel like, all right, so there's people making money that way. It seems pretty much like a bubble to me, but also bubbles form around new stuff all the time. That doesn't necessarily invalidate um, it doesn't necessarily prove that there's nothing there. It just proves that there might be something there plus a lot of hot air. Um, I don't know, maybe you'll make a million dollars on cryptocurrency, Tosh, and have you done so? <laughs> not yet, not yet, no. You can lose a million dollars on cryptocurrency too, it seems to me. So I, I, it's not really a game for me, um, but it is, it's interesting to see so much money sloshing around. It's weird, right? Like it feels like the roaring 20s. Mm -hmm. um, and if you look back at history, these were also, these were very volatile times uh, that, that had that dynamic, but they were also very generative times, like many, many new ideas, many new uh, subcultures uh, developed around the, these kinds of rushes of speculative capital. Um, there's an economist, Carlotta Perez, who does a great job of documenting history here and also how it fed into big innovations like uh, railroads, canals, uh, electrical grids, um, the internet, actually, the internet infrastructure was fueled by the dot-com bubble, which then burst. And when I started working, it was right toward the tail end of the dot-com bubble. It was like the, the least cool thing in the world to be in tech. It was so lame. Everyone hated it. And I got into it because, like, I was, I don't know, like, just a kid from a middle state with no college education. And it, it was like, a, it was like, I couldn't go anywhere else, right? So, um Crypto has a little bit of that flavor as mm. well um, mm. uh, to me. Mm. Uh, that doesn't mean it's good. It just means it's it's weird, right? It's asymmetric. Mm. Um, so I'm keeping half an eye, I guess, on that space. Yeah, uh, I'll be, it's interesting to me to notice how much of the trends that we've talked about are like adjacent to the structure of capitalism writ large. And mm. it, mm, I mean, I could see it going any number of ways, but I would be interested yeah. to see something 
happened that sort of shifted the structure of capitalism in a, in a net positive way. I mean, obviously it could be negative and, 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 you know, I don't mean to naively say like yeah. capitalism is bad, like definitely has its advantages sure. as you were talking about, but it also has disadvantages, I think. And um, it'd be interesting to see if any of these technologies could like fundamentally rebuild capitalism in a good way. Yeah. I, I almost feel like they're this eldritch force, you know, mm. um, I'll give you my, my gritted teeth prediction and then okay. my optimistic prediction. So my gritted teeth prediction is like, anytime you, you make something legible to software, you get this sort of phenomenon of like algorithmic trading. It's almost like this, this emergent epiphenomenon, like computers run so much faster than people that if you make a process uh, controllable and understandable by computers, it's, it's like that process takes off and does something beyond the, the, the understanding or interests of human beings. Mm -hmm. It might be a system that is like, uh, that is uh, sustainable in its own sense, but it, it doesn't, like humans don't even necessarily enter into the equation. So we see weird things, right? Like flash crashes and we don't even understand what happened there. It was like, oh, some bots did something. There was a feedback loop. We just had to hit the shutoff switch. Um, so my gritted teeth thing is like, if we make, you know, economics and corporations and all of this stuff uh, legible to software, man, there's a way in which that is going to outstrip regulation or any sense of human well-being. It's just going to be a process that exists for its own sake, doing its own thing. And this is already kind of true, right? This is not a cryptocurrency thing. Like we have a bunch of computers and algorithms hooked up to the economy. We have stuff like algorithmic hedge funds, uh, flash trading bots, and they're doing things we don't really understand. They're making people a bunch of money on speculation, uh, but we don't really know if that's good or bad or, or maybe like a benevolent parasite on the system. Like it's sort of beyond, uh, <laughs> beyond our understanding. There's a bunch of processes in nature like this too, right? Like a virus doesn't really care about us. We're just a substrate, but like <laughs> it's party time for COVID. Um, so that's, that's my like gritty, gritted teeth kind of like eek. Uh, this could be really scary kind of thing about cryptocurrencies. Um, I think there's maybe a, uh, like a, here's my optimistic, bounded to optimistic take, which is like, everything is already like this anyway. Like we are in all of these weird co-evolutionary loops with nature and with our environment. We're sort of, you know, we're changing our environment by burning fossil fuel. We have to figure out how to repair that. We're going to eventually uh, have to figure out how to take um, CO2 back out of the sky, probably. And that might involve its own ugly solutions. Um, because you can't, if you've been burning concentrated trees, you can plant trees, but there's a fundamental like rate mismatch. Um, we, <laughs> we, we, we do large scale factory farming and that's enabled, you know, 8 billion people to survive and maybe 10 billion in a few years, um, more than ever before in human history, but it's also stripped topsoil and been really bad for the environment. And there's barely any, you know, sort of like uh, wild nature left. It's it's like a fractional percentage. I have it written down somewhere in my notebook, but I remember it's less than 50%. It might even be as low as something like eight or 10. Um, if you just add up all the biomass of wild animals, um, that seems really sad, right? Um, but it's, it's this evolutionary loop we're caught in and we can't wish it away. We have to figure out how to make amends for uh, this, but also like maybe garden our way out of it in a way that's hu as, as humane as possible for everyone. Um, so I, I, I hope that there's space within cryptocurrency for mutualism and for ways of reimagining capitalism. Seems to me like the idea of markets you can program, that, that feels important. Because um, like, you know, the old school vision of, of capitalism and markets is that they're these sort of systems that you set and forget and that they always find the, the perfect equilibrium. And we know now through complexity economics and other sciences that that's not true. Um, when markets work well, it's a byproduct of almost like having a healthy microbiome, like a healthy economy is one that is diverse and made up of a bunch of different sectors and a bunch of different players and where there's not too much inequality. And economies can be just like ecosystems, they can sort of fall into these 
these negative, these bad attractors, like they can become monocrops, like a sort of maybe like an oil based economy would be like that, like, uh, like an economy that basically largely makes its profit through extraction of a natural resource or logging or something like that. That's just not a very diverse or resilient or sustainable way of being. Um, and I don't know if we understand, my, my sense is that we don't understand yet what it takes to build a resilient, healthy economy that's fair. Um, but perhaps the introduction of software in the loop might allow us to sort of program things. Like, this is kind of what a lot of folks are experimenting with, right? It's, it's, it's like this notion of like, what if we program taxes into the smart contract such that every, every transaction I make skims a tiny bit off the top in order to fund the infrastructure that's running the whole system or maybe fund some other public good. So, um, you know, Vitalik Buterin of Ethereum and other people have spent a lot of time thinking about, can we use these things to fund public goods? I, I think that's an interesting design space and thought space. Um, maybe we can also use these things to find ways to fund software that is cooperatively owned. That seems compelling to me. There's stuff like Gitcoin that's playing with that idea. Um, I feel like we need to find a way to fund software <laughs> that's collaboratively owned because more and more of our lives is mediated by networked software and, and almost all of it, right, really already. And uh, it seems unfortunate to me if that is, is, is like an, if that outcome ends up being owned by one company or even a small number of companies, that, that doesn't sound like a good future. I would much rather, uh, if we have to live in a, <laughs> in a world mediated by network software, I'd rather it be network software that we all sort of construct and own together, right? Um, hmm. So that's, a, that, that's my half hopeful take, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, half hopeful, yes. Uh, is there anything nearby, any of the topics that we've discussed that you'd like to say more about? Yeah, good question. Um, can I make a book recommendation or two? Sure. Yes. I think I might have them with me actually traveling. These are two books that I've been reading in bits for a couple of years now that have influenced a lot of my thinking. Uh, one I mentioned, The Nature of Technology by Brian mm -hmm. Arthur. Really good. Um, and this is the one that explores uh, the way in which technology evolves. If you've ever read Kevin Kelly, he writes a lot about this too. I uh, <laughs> I think of this as like the hard science fiction version of Kevin Kelly. Like okay. he gets into he gets into the uh, the, the mechanisms and like does um, some real scientific inquiry here, uh, trying to understand how this could be true. Um, Brian Arthur too is sort of a giant in in science. Uh, he was one of the founding sort of characters in this field called complexity science and. Um, a lot of his writing and podcasts are just phenomenal. He's got a lot of interviews out there. Uh, so I recommend that stuff. Uh, the other one is if for anyone who's into like web stuff, uh, this is a little bit dry, but it's called Designing an Internet by David D. Clark. And David D. Clark was one of the, um, he was one of the leads of the Internet Engineering Task Force at one point in the early days, if I remember correctly. So, but what he does in this book is he's, he, it's like an, a history of the architectural decisions that were made uh, about the internet, uh, paths not taken, uh, weird ways in which the web has been exacted and evolved. And it's, it's, um, it's a bit technical, uh, but uh, for me, it's been invaluable you so rarely do you get a history or like the to peer into the head of the people who built these systems um, and the, the internet has problems but it's also been remarkably successful like it's pretty wild actually that it's made it as far as it has and, and been this resilient so I think there's a lot to learn from it um, and maybe we can do better too right like we can learn and then hopefully surpass without repeating some of the same mistakes mm -hmm. um, who can say but there's a lot of very enlightened design decisions in, in this book. And I like the headers, like adding headers to subconscious and subtext that was directly inspired by this book. Um, so I've benefited a lot from his thinking. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks for the book recommendations and also for coming back on the show. It's been such a delight to dive deeper into these topics with you. And uh, I know I'll be chewing on this for quite a while. So thank you for making the time. 
Thank you for making the time. This has been a long one, but it's really rare to be able to dialogue about topics like this. They're, they're pretty complex, and I think it can be tricky to unspool them. I, I love talking with you. Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. My pleasure.